I'm Professor Jonathan Twining from Eastern Nazarene College. I'm accompanying Dr. John Cassell of Northwest Nazarene University and a group of his students to Northern Idaho to study a creature that is only found in this part of the world, the Idaho giant salamander, Dicamptodon ateremus. The day dawns for the start of our adventure. We load up all the gear we'll need for a week of camping and exploring. I sure hope we have enough room for all that gear. Finally, it's time to head off down the road. Weir Creek, here we come. To find this elusive salamander, we are traveling north from Doc Cassell's ranch in Marsin through the Valley of the Snake River, one of the major rivers of the Pacific Northwest. Along the way, we will cross not only the Snake River, but also the Salmon, the Clearwater, and the Locksaw Rivers. Many of these rivers are known for salmon and trout fishing, as well as whitewater rafting. The Clearwater River, the largest tributary of the Snake River, is about 75 miles long and drains about 9,645 square miles of land. The river received its name from the Nez Perce tribe and does indeed have clear water along much of its length. The river has three sections or forks. The middle fork is formed at the confluence of the Locksaw and Selway rivers at this spot in Lowell, Idaho. It looks kind of foggy today, but in reality the air is full of smoke from a nearby forest fire. The Locksaw River is about 70 miles long and its watershed covers nearly 1,200 square miles. The river is protected under the National Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. In summer, there are a few stretches of this river that live up to its Nez Perce name, which is rough water. In the spring, however, when the river is surging, it is considered one of the world's best for whitewater rafting and kayaking. Our destination in the search for the giant salamander is a tributary of the Locksaw River named Weir Creek. The creek is located approximately 45 miles east of where the Locksaw joins the Selway. To get there, we travel along US Route 12 on the north side of the Locksaw, close to the trail that the Nez Perce tribe traveled to hunt buffalo in Montana and that Lewis and Clark used in 1805 to explore this territory. Finally, we arrive at our destination, the Colgate Campground along the Locksaw River, about five miles beyond Weir Creek. This will be our base of operations for the next week as we search for the giant salamander. Everyone takes a minute to introduce themselves before setting about the task of setting up camp and eating dinner. With the sun going down, we all hit the sack early to get rested for our long days ahead on Weir Creek. As I lay down in my tent, I can hear the sound of the Locksaw River, a lullaby that soon finds me fast asleep. Join us as we begin our search for the Idaho Giant Salamander next on Chasing Giants. 
The Idaho giant salamander is the largest salamander in Idaho and is endemic to Idaho and Montana, meaning they are found here and nowhere else in the world. According to Dr. Cassell, it is a species that biologists in the state of Idaho are just beginning to understand. As I recall, early on when we started this collaboration, part of the question was how abundant is this species? How well distributed are they in the state? I mean, there are species of conservation concern, but how concerned should we be? No, nobody knew the answers to that, or at least very thoroughly. Adult Idaho giants grow to lengths of 10 to 12 inches and have robust heads and bodies. The base color of terrestrial forms is light metallic brown overlain by blotches of dark brown, giving it a marbled appearance. They do have grooves on their sides, but they are more difficult to distinguish than those found on some other salamander species. Idaho giants are found in three phases. The larval phase is fully aquatic, lives in streams, and has shorter, smaller gills than those species of salamanders found in ponds and lakes. Sometimes the larval form becomes a sexually mature adult, but retains its gills and remains fully aquatic. This is the second phase, known as a pedomorph. More rarely seen is the terrestrial adult stage, living in moist forests along stream banks and undercover objects such as logs or bark. While we hope to find one of these during our study of Weir Creek, it is the larvae and pedomorphs we are most likely to encounter in the stream. This project started more than 10 years ago when Dr. Cassell made the acquaintance of Dr. Joel Sauter, a regional non-game biologist for the Clearwater region of Idaho Fish and Game and an alumnus of Northwest Nazarene University. We were at a Wildlife Society meeting in Boise and I knew Joel was an alum from NNU, saw him there. We were, had been acquainted beforehand. I'd say at some break, Joel and I started talking. It's like, hey, what do you think about maybe Idaho Giants and with your role as non-game biologist and they were a species of concern, you kind of like, yeah, that's, that's cool. I had wanted to find some way to get students involved in research. Um, I had been blessed at my time at NNU with a, the ability to get out in the field that had really been instrumental in me getting the, the current career that I have and so I was looking to provide that opportunity for students. Just by the nature of funding for non-game species in Idaho, he's not operating on a multi-million dollar budget. At the same time, NNU's got limited access to resources but we've got a lot of highly motivated, intelligent students that are hard workers and so with Joel's funds that he could supply some of the equipment and he provides meals and pit tags and things like that and I provide the manpower through NNU students. Uh, it's a great collaboration. On the morning after our arrival, we gather in the parking area at Weir Creek. After putting on our waders and water shoes, we check to make sure we have all the gear required for the day. It's a long hike back to the parking lot if you forget something. Dr. Sauter and Dr. Cassell give some last minute instructions before we head out, including some funny stories about some of their previous adventures. I'm like, there's one, and I let off the juice and talk. Grab him and I'm like, well, you gotta reach in there and grab him. I won't get, get zapped. <laughs> It's finally time to start the difficult trek to the upper reaches of the study area. We head off down the trail to begin our quest to find the Idaho giant salamander. The two teams are employing a unique method of capturing Idaho giant salamanders called electroshocking. This method is most often used in fish research, 
but Cassell and Sauter have been using this method to capture amphibians in Weir Creek for the past nine years. The fisheries biologists were surveying streams for uh, fish and occasionally they would see an Idaho giant and they'd make a note that they an uh, observation of the species. Um, they weren't sampling using a methodology designed to find salamanders. So when John and I got involved in this, we worked to find a technology or a technique that would work to find these uh, individuals more reliably. Um, and we did some rock rolling, which is kind of the traditional way of finding amphibians in streams, um, but it really is not that efficient. So we started experimenting with electrofishing um, and found that it really was efficient for finding Idaho giants when you shock the right type of water. Electroshocking does not require the movement of rocks from the stream bottom or substrate, which can disturb the habitat. Instead, two electrodes apply a mild electric shock to sites a salamander can occupy, irritating salamanders enough to drive them from their hiding places. Then the salamanders can be captured in nets or by hand. The teams walk upstream from their starting point, shocking each side of the stream as they walk along. Even the side channels are covered. This is not an easy task when you have to climb over fallen trees and walk over slippery rocks for several hours. After a salamander is captured, it is placed in a labeled plastic container. This, in turn, is placed in one of the live wells spaced every 100 meters starting at the 50 meter mark. The salamanders will be kept in the live wells until they can be measured and tagged. A red flag is placed in the exact spot where each salamander is captured. By the end of the first day, the two teams have captured over 100 Idaho giant salamanders over the 1,200 meter stream reach. So now that we have all these salamanders, what are we gonna do with them? Find out next on Chasing Giants. Let's actually put those salamanders right here so I can see them and you can hand them to me. The data recorder is going to sit here so they can read the pit tag. After a good night's sleep and an amazing breakfast, it's time to measure each of the captured salamanders, scan them for tags from previous years, and insert new tags into unmarked individuals. Each salamander is anesthetized to minimize stress levels while they are being handled. The anesthetizing agent is a chemical called MS-222, which is absorbed through their skin and gills. The lengths and weights of each captured salamander are recorded. Because the tails of some salamanders can be lost, the length measurement is made from the tip of the snout to the cloacal opening on the underside of the body near the hind legs. This is called the snout to vent length. The salamanders are weighed with a portable digital balance. Each of the captured salamanders is scanned with an electronic reader to detect the presence of passive integrated transponders or pit tags. Yeah, so there's no tag in that animal or else that would have beeped. A pit tag is a type of radio frequency identification device, or RFID, which can be implanted beneath the skin of an animal. Each pit tag has a unique identification number which can be read with a scanner. In this way, a scientist can distinguish between individual salamanders when captured in subsequent years. If no pit tag is detected in one of the captured salamanders, a new pit tag is inserted under the skin into the abdominal cavity using a hypodermic needle. Once the pit tag is inserted, 
the animal is returned to the live well until all salamanders have been measured and tagged. Idaho giants are not the only creatures found in Weir Creek. The salamanders share their habitat with other species, including amphibians, reptiles, fish, and insects. The Idaho giant salamanders in some of the smaller streams by biomass, they're the top predator in those headwater streams. As a predator, they can have major trophic influences uh, in that ecosystem, but they also are really important prey items. So garter snakes and other animals living in association with that stream are gonna rely on amphibians. I know giants is a prey source, so. Another amphibian found in Weir Creek is the tailed frog. These small brownish colored frogs lack a tympanic membrane, but do have a tail, which is actually an extension of the male cloaca. This copulatory organ is used to transfer sperm to females. The tadpoles of this species have a sucker-like mouth, which allows them to attach to rocks and maintain their position in the stream's current. The mouth is also used to graze on diatoms from the rocky substrate. The other thing that we're accomplishing this year is that we're getting a really detailed uh, map of the habitat in the stream along 10 meter reaches. And it, I don't know what the student's perspective of that was, but this morning we had a I think a fruitful and educational chat about what variables we could measure and should measure and how we might measure them. Parts of that conversation might have been frustrating. I could tell some of them were getting antsy and like, okay, let's just get on with something. But I think it was a good learning experience for them to, you know, know how science works. So, and I think the variables were meaningful to them after seeing the salamanders during the week and then. Uh, measuring them today and we really got a routine ironed out and I was really pleased with that and I think we'll have a nice detailed set of data for uh, future analyses. So. Finally, it's time for Operation Freedom, the releasing of the salamanders back into the stream. Each is released within one meter of the place it was captured. This is important so that, if it is recaptured in subsequent years, the team can track its movements within the stream. While the team is releasing salamanders, Dr. Cassell comments on the importance of conserving salamander species like the Idaho Giants. So, I guess the, the, the question being, why should anybody even care about Idaho Giant salamanders or amphibians in general? Even if amphibians had absolutely no um, contribution to us as a species, as human beings, they still have their own value as living organisms. Uh, so even if we're off the planet, amphibians still should be conserved. So, But just thinking, okay, well, if they aren't some good for us as human beings, then who cares about them? But really, they, they're unique and have us a right to be on the planet as well. And if, if any of those species are lost because of activities of human beings, then you know, I think that ethically, morally, that's wrong. Well, after a long hot day on the trail and stream, there is no better way to cool off than jumping in the Locksaw River. <laughs> 
after the water hole, we head off to the Locksaw Lodge for our first hot shower in a week and a good meal with great people. What a fantastic way to end our week. Next on Chasing Giants, we'll hear from Dr. Cassell and the students as they reflect on their search for the Idaho giant salamander. As our time with the Idaho giant salamanders draws to a close, it's time to think about what has been accomplished over the last week. Before we break camp, we take time to reflect. Okay, so I guess the question is, what have we accomplished at Salamander Camp this year, 2014? I have to say, this has been a little more leisurely than most camps. One of the things that we did was uh, repeat what we've done the past eight years, and that is a survey to see how many salamanders we can detect in Weir Creek. So we did a good job of that. We reduced it to only one pass instead of three or four tagged. 100 animals and I think Joel said maybe 13 or 15 recaptures so we'll be able to look at those recaptured animals and determine how much they've grown where they moved in the stream since they were last caught so and of course lots of delicious food and great fellowship so it's been a wonderful camp as a college professor I'm always eager to find out what the students have learned I sat down with a few of them to ask about their salamander camp experience. At salamander camp we have the opportunity to go through all sorts of different experiences. We have to survey the streams and then go through and analyze data later and we also have to interact with people along the stream and let them know, that, know, let them know what we're doing and kind of give them some insight. And being from this state and looking at the Idaho giant salamander species is really unique because I'm from Idaho and so it gives you an opportunity to relate it to something in your state that is more personal to you. And so that's been a great experience for me. One of the things that I learned in this salamander camp has been how hard people work for their research. And also another thing that I've noticed is how fast people bond when they spend so much time with each other. So I'm sure these next few years I'll be great friends with everyone here. One of the things that I really know that I'm going to take back uh, from Salamander Camp is uh, friends that I get to spend time with and uh, being here with uh, people and just having a fun time out in the field doing research. I don't know, it's just been such an awesome experience for me. I've never been able to do anything like this before. I've never had the opportunity before. So just having the chance to go out in the field and work in the stream and, you know, slip on the rocks and fall in the stream and catch the salamanders and just everything about it has just been so awesome for me because it's, it's stuff that I really enjoy doing. So for me, it's been more like a vacation than it has been work or research. It was very fun to actually um, kind of go outside by normal boundaries and see what um, see what we have here at home. It was really cool to see that even for a biologist who's been working a really long time they have to think through all of those um, variables, they have to think how they're going to get people into the field, what their supplies are, um, how they're going to accomplish everything and it was really cool to just see that um, played out and see that that is possible and that especially brainstorming with other scientists or the other people on your team can help you figure out exactly how you're going to perform an experiment um, and it was just really cool to see that all happen. This year one of the things that I've been really learning is that it does take a lot of teamwork to get these things accomplished. It wouldn't be possible without all of the students that have participated over the nine years and it wouldn't be possible without our cooperation with Idaho Fish and Game. What you get out of Salamander Camp is more than just um, the friendships you build and the people you meet. It's about learning how to uh, run a whole process um, from beginning to end. Um, that includes setting up data, what data is important to get, and how you analyze the data. It gave me the experience I wouldn't have had in any other place. I mean, being out in northern Idaho in the woods, on the river, um, out in the field getting that experience. It's something you can't replicate in a classroom at all. 
doing salamander cam, why should you do it? I mean, it's an un unforgettable experience. Salamander by far has that stature of um, pushing you forward in, in your academics at school. You can think more clearly, you understand the process, especially as a scientist, it helps develop more skills than just what you can use in school. It uh, helps you develop critical thinking skills. This is something that I would like to do um, for my career. I think Salamander Camp was definitely something that is going to help me get into the job of my dreams. The biggest benefit for me from Salamander Camp simply has to be um, just the affirmation that I really enjoy this kind of thing, that I, I could have a career in field biology. I mean, it, it's just been, it's been my first experience and it has just, I've enjoyed it so much and I've seen all of it um, and that has to be it for me, just understanding um, that it's something I really do have a passion for and being able to experience that and, and know that. Because that's something that I would like to get into is field biology and field work or field research and I find it a benefit to be out here actually doing research on a certain species that we don't know much about. I'm more of a hands-on person. I love to actually be out there doing something and um, uh, growing up on a ranch and then doing this field work, it, it's, it really more so the lab work brings out the childhood curiosity in me that's so important to scientists. Even though the field that I want to get into is not necessarily field research. You're still doing research and you're still going through the same processes to find the data. And so I think even though it doesn't directly correlate to what I want to do, it gives you the same it gives you the basic knowledge and the general idea of how to do things in a professional manner. Well, it's finally time to leave and head back to the Nampa area. As we drive back along Route 12, Doc Cassell has one final surprise for us. We stopped by a small creek on Route 12 to look for another amphibian, the Coeur d'Alene salamander. This salamander is in a group that does not have any lungs, but instead breathes through its skin. As I admire the waterfall, Becca Cassell locates our prize, a small Coeur d'Alene salamander. We were also rewarded one final time by finding two large Idaho giants in the pool below the waterfall. What a great way to end our adventure together. The long drive home is a tedious one, but we finally make it, just as the Idaho sun sets on our search for the Idaho giant salamanders. <laughs>